Hello there, my ancient Greek friends, and welcome back to another episode from my Mythical Creatures lore series. Like I said in my latest poll, I wanted, at least for a couple of weeks, to try and make each week's topic into something a bit more thematic. So this time it was a Greek creature, and yes, I know Talos is an automaton and not a monster. Next week, probably something Halloween related, but we're gonna see. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the infamous Hydra, with a particular focus on the Lernian Hydra today. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? In a nutshell, the Hydra is a huge, immortal, many-headed reptilian monster who haunted the swamps around the region known as Lerna in ancient Greece. Although this monster claimed hundreds of lives, it is arguably most famous for its battle with the hero Heracles, or, as you probably know him better, Hercules. In classical Greece, Lerna was a region of springs and a former lake near the eastern coast of the Peloponnesus, south of Argos. Even though much of the area is marshy, Lerna is located on a geographically narrow point between the mountains and the sea along an ancient route from the Argolid. This location could have potentially resulted in the importance of the settlement itself. Supposedly, Lerna was also one of the entrances to the underworld, and the ancient Lernian mysteries, sacred to the goddess Demeter, were celebrated there. Pausania says, and I quote, that the mysteries were initiated by Philemon, the twin other of Autolycus. Heroes could gain entry to the underworld via the Alcinian Lake. Pausanias also writes, and I quote, There is no limit to the depth of the Alcinian Lake, and I know of nobody who by any contrivance has been able to reach the bottom of it, since not even Nero, who had ropes made several states long and fastened them together, tying lead to them, and omitting nothing that might help his experiment, was able to discover any limit to its depth. This too, I heard. The water of the lake is, to all appearance, calm and quiet. But, although it is such to look at, every swimmer who ventures to cross it is dragged down, sucked into the depths, and swept away. Now, the Hydra was a fearsome creature, many times more ferocious than others of its reptilian family. Not only was this swamp-dwelling monster larger than any known snake, it had somewhere between 6 and 100 heads. Each of the Hydra heads was supported by a long neck, so the other heads could coil around each other or fan out and attack challengers from every side and even from behind. Eventually, all those necks welded together into a fat body, which trailed along the ground behind the monster. Other depictions show the heads welding to a thick tail, either with very stubby and underdeveloped legs or no legs at all. Some show the tail forking at the end into two or even more smaller tails. The Hydra also had a nasty personality to match its horrid appearance. It ravaged all the villages around Lake Lerna, devouring hundreds of people. When the Hydra wasn't filling its stomach with human meat, it slumbered in a deep swamp cave, which was also rumored to be one of the entrances to the underworld. Thus, the Hydra can also be said to have had a bit of a sentinel role. Only hunger or rage could draw the monster out of its lair, otherwise it was kinda mindless and lazy. The Hydra was the offspring of two of ancient Greece's most famous monsters, Typhon, an immortal giant, and Echidna, a half-woman and half-snake character, not to be confused with the Lamia. In fact, these two are supposed to have had so many mythological offspring that Echidna is, and was often known, as the mother of monsters. Together, they gave the Hydra its immortality, its monstrous form, and a pretty evil disposition. Hera, the wife of Zeus, adopted the Hydra when it was just a baby. She raised the creature with the intent of using it to destroy Heracles, a hero she really had a chip on the shoulder for. She found a home for it, protected it from harm, and nurtured its destructive impulses. It is no mistake that Hera chose the Hydra as one of Heracles' most famous labors too. 
This monster also had abilities that could easily send any hero into the underworld. First and foremost, the blood of the Hydra was full of super toxic poison. Some people simply died from approaching the beast lair or smelling its poisonous blood and breath. Even after the Hydra was slaughtered, its blood was used as the weapon that brought down many strong fighters. Second, the Hydra was immortal and had ridiculously powerful regenerative abilities. The monster had one immortal head, which was protected by all the others that grew around it. If any of the mortal heads were cut away, two or more would sprout from the monster's body to replace the loss. Thus, the beast could only be killed by cutting away the immortal head, which was nearly an impossible task. And now, let us get to what we're all here for. The mythical battle between Heracles and the Hydra. Heracles was the son of Zeus, but he wasn't the son of Zeus's wife, Hera. Hera was a notoriously jealous goddess, even though Zeus kept cheating on her again and again. Shortly after Heracles was born, Hera found out about Zeus's infidelity and demanded that he banish his son from Mount Olympus. But even that punishment was not enough for Hera. As she was watching the boy grow into a young Greek hero, she grew angrier and angrier still. Eventually, Heracles got to the point in his life where he had to complete the legendary 12 labors. Hera saw a golden opportunity to get rid of the boy once and for all. She adopted the Hydra and began training it to be one of Greece's most fearsome monsters, a monster that had to be almost impossible to kill. Sure enough, slaying the Hydra did become one of Heracles' 12 labors, much to the delight of the Queen of the Gods. Heracles would enter the Lernian swamp with his mouth and nose covered in thick fabric, so he wouldn't have to breathe in the monster's poisonous scent. He crept around the cave around the spring of Amimone, where the monster supposedly slept, and began shooting fiery arrows into it. After a few moments, the Hydra, enraged, charged out of the cave, ready to tear the assailant to shreds. But Heracles was ready too. He began cutting off the Hydra heads as fast as he could. Though the monster was shrieking in pain, the injuries were not life-threatening. In fact, they only made the Hydra stronger, as new heads grew to replace each one that was lost. After a few minutes of battle, Heracles realized that this was not the way to defeat the Hydra. Desperate, he called out to Iolus, his nephew, who brought a torch and began burning the bloody stumps as fast as Heracles cut off the heads. Lo and behold, the cauterized stumps prevented the new heads from growing. Slowly but surely, despite its best efforts to slay Heracles, the Hydra was running out of heads. When Hera saw that Heracles and Iolus had found a way to kill the monster, she was so angry that she sent a giant crab to distract Heracles. Unfortunately for the crab, Heracles was too much of a badass, and he simply crushed it under his foot. Finally, Heracles managed to hack his way to the Hydra's lone immortal head. He cut this one off with a golden sword gifted to him by Athena, and buried it under a huge rock. Despite the fact that he had slaughtered the terrible Hydra, some people, including Heracles' boss at the time, King Eurystheus, claimed that Heracles did not complete the mission because he had required Iolus' help. You see, one of the rules for these labors was that Heracles was supposed to do them all by himself. There is an alternate version of the myth as well, where after cutting off one of the heads, he then dipped the sword into its neck and used the venom to burn each head so it could never grow back. The goddess Hera, upset that Heracles had slain the monster she had trained, placed it in the dark vault of the sky as the constellation Hydra. And also as a constellation prize, she also ascended that poor crushed crab into the constellation known today as Cancer. Heracles, for his part, would later use the arrows dipped in the Hydra's blood to kill other foes during the remaining labors, such as the Stymphalian birds and the giant Geryon. But even dead, the Hydra did have its revenge. A centaur known as Nessus was one of those enemies that Heracles killed with the poisonous arrows. 
As he was lying there, dying, Nessus beckoned to Heracles' wife and told her that his blood, spilled by her husband, could be used as a love charm that would make her husband faithful to her forever. In fact, Nessus's blood was tainted by the Hydra poison, and had become a weapon by itself. Not knowing any of this, Heracles' wife dipped his clothes in his blood, and gave them to Heracles to wear. As soon as the cloth touched Heracles' skin, the Hydra's poison began to burn his flesh, and it continued burning it until the hero was dead. Thus, in the end, the Hydra did claim the life of Heracles for its own. The oldest of the Hydra-esque narratives appears in Hesiod's Theogony, while the oldest images of the monster are found on a pair of bronze fibulae dating back to around 700 BC. In both these sources, the main motifs of the Hydra myth are already present, a multi-headed serpent slain by Heracles and Aeolus. While the fibulae portray a six-headed Hydra, its number of heads was first fixed in writing by Alcaeus, around 600 BC, who gave it nine heads. Simonides, a century later, increased the number to 50, while Euripides, Virgil, and other Roman writers did not give an exact figure. Like the initial number of heads, the monster's ability to regenerate lost heads can vary from time and author. The first mention of this ability occurs with Euripides, where the monster grew a pair of heads for each one severed by Heracles. In the Euthydemus of Plato, Socrates likens Euripides and his brother to a hydra of a sophistical nature, who grows two arguments for each one refuted. Depictions of the monster dating back to 500 BC show it with a double tail as well as multiple heads, suggesting that same regeneration ability at work. The Hydra also has parallels in other Near Eastern religions. In particular, Sumerian, Babylonian, and Assyrian mythology celebrate the deeds of the war and hunting god Ninurta, whom the Angim credited with slaying 11 monsters on the expedition to the mountains, including a seven-headed serpent. Nowadays, the Hydra may not be as famous a creature as the Minotaur, for example, at least not as a standalone character associated with the Lernian myth. It is still among the top three monsters, if you will, which come to mind when you talk about the labors of Heracles. Interestingly, the Hydra, an unnatural creature, made a name for itself in other natural sciences. Constellations and technological tools have been named for it in astronomy. Also, there is an entire genus of tiny tentacled sea creatures bearing the monster's name, the Hydrozoa. Last but not least, although not exactly in its Lernian myth incarnation, the Hydra is often used in fantasy literature and video games, where it is almost always a powerful enemy that a hero or heroes must defeat as part of a challenge. Although its body may differ, the themes of many heads that sometimes grow back as you cut them, the poison and the regeneration are prevalent among all the other incarnations of the creature in present day mediums. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you on the mythical Hydra for today. Now, is this powerful monster among your favorite Greek mythical creatures? What do you like or dislike most about it? Do you know of any other famous stories featuring the Hydra? Do let us all know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Was the episode informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. Also, in regards to this particular series, I would kindly ask you to support it if you can. I'm only asking because these videos don't usually get as many views as my regular 40k ones, but I still like making them and I want to keep the series going. Alas, you can also click the infamous bell notification icon to stay more up to date. Thank you very much for watching, this is GDN signing off.